Father in heaven, help me to preach your word and to share your heart today. In Jesus' name, amen. Sabbath morning a few weeks ago, we were on our way to church. A Spanish mission high in the mountains of Baja, California, Sur, Mexico, in San Javier. It was a mission built in the late 1600s. As we turned off the main highway, we encountered some obstacles in the road. A string of horses and a drove of donkeys. Yes, I looked it up. That's the correct way to say it. A string of horses and a drove of donkeys in the middle of the road. A car from the opposite direction approached and started honking. And Pastor Phil began to honk his horn too. And the horses moved on, but there was still a donkey by the side of the road. And I rolled down my window. The donkey unhesitatingly approached our car and stuck his head in for a personal greeting. As you can see in the pictures. I patted him and petted him on the side of his face and then I reached my hands around and I rubbed his velvety ears in the back. Later that evening, we encountered two more burrows wandering in the scrub. I tried to coax them in the vehicle with carrots and one skittishly approached. Most of you know me pretty well. You know my love for animals. I jokingly say that I haven't seen an animal or a bird unless I've touched it. We called the animal our little burrito. And of course you know that the actual literal translation of burrito is a small donkey, a small burrow. And by the way, this was Pastor Phil's idea for a sermon title. It was the Sunday of the week of crucifixion, but the disciples were unaware of the doom on the horizon. Sabbath had been spent with friends in Bethany, a mere two miles from Jerusalem. Now Jesus and his disciples were on the move, on foot, as usual. And suddenly Jesus turned to two of his disciples and he said, go into the village opposite you, and immediately you will find a donkey tied and a burrito with her, a colt. Loose her and bring her to me. And by the way, if anyone says anything to you, you shall say, the Lord has need of them, and immediately he will send them. Now you may be wondering what's in the world. What's going on here? Jesus has been traveling by foot for three and a half years. And now he's asking for a burrito, a colt, a little donkey. But I want you to notice another word that Jesus uses. He specifically says, the Lord, the Lord has need of them. And I like what you said, Art, about how Jesus today was was just, he was focused, he was on that trajectory to the cross. And this is part of the story. The Lord has need of them. And alert, Jesus has never referred to himself as Lord until this moment. He's always referred to himself as the Son of Man. 
So why the switch in language? Because this is the moment that he will demonstrate that he is Lord and King. This is a prophetic moment. The disciples realize it and they're excited. After all their attempts to make Jesus king, he finally is going to ride in Jerusalem as king and he will vanquish the Roman authorities and set up his kingdom. Hallelujah! They knew the prophecies, they understood the implications. They were on the cutting edge of the kingdom of God. Jacob had prophesied regarding Judah's future. The scepter shall not depart from Judah, nor a lawgiver from between his feet until Shiloh comes. And to him shall be the obedience of the people, binding his donkey to the vine and his donkey's colt, a burrito, to the choice vine. Rabbis had long held this to be a messianic prophecy. And then, years and years later, Zechariah the prophet had prophesied in Zechariah 9.9, Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion, shout! O daughter of Jerusalem, behold, your king is coming to you. He is just and having salvation, lowly and riding on a donkey, a colt, the foal of a donkey. I want you to take off your sanctimonious Monday night quarterback position and enter into the joy of the moment without the loaded knowledge of what happens next. Enter into the joy of the disciples. If you are a disciple, you have the prophetic charts of what the Messiah is to do and in what order and what comes next. I mean, don't we have our prophetic charts too sometimes? Jesus has healed. He's fed the 5,000 and the 4,000. He's raised the dead. He's preached in Samaria. Can you believe it? Now you get it. It's time. He's referred to himself as Lord. He wants a colt. He's going to ride into Jerusalem on a donkey, and it means one big thing. He's going to proclaim that he's the Messiah, and he's going to set up his kingdom. He's going to conquer the Romans and usher in the world of peace. Yay! The disciples trip over themselves in their eagerness to get to the village and get the donkey. Look, there's the donkey and the colt, just like Jesus said. Let's untie him and let's go. Wait, what are you doing taking my donkey and colt? (gasps) Don't you know? Haven't you heard? Hasn't anybody ever told you? This is a great day. Our Lord, the Messiah, has need of it. And wow, look at you. You're going to see in the future the new king of Israel. The Messiah has ridden my colt and become king. And by the way, you know that a king doesn't ask for permission to use an animal. A king issues a command and people obey. Everyone they meet, They rattle off the good news. Jesus is going to ride in Jerusalem today. And he's going to be proclaimed king. And by the time they get back to Jesus, a crowd is gathered. As one person shares it with another, and that person shares it with others, and people begin cutting palm branches and waving them. And they they cut off some of the olive branches trees and wave them the moment comes it's about 10 o'clock in the morning 
and the disciples helped Jesus onto the donkey. Can't you picture it? Jesus getting on the donkey, petting its velvety ears and whispering in its ear, you're a pretty special little girl. People down through the ages will talk about you. Lazarus is there. Leading the procession, he knows that Jesus is Lord. Jesus raised him from the dead. Only the Messiah could do that. The healed, the formerly blind, the deaf, the dumb, the lepers are all in the crowd and everyone shouting, singing, rejoicing. The crowd swells and people place their cloaks on the ground for the donkey to walk on. Their king, the Messiah, is on his way to Jerusalem. Palm branches wave, palm fronds. There are people in front and some are beside and some are behind, but everyone is excited. Hosanna! To the son of David, Ben David, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Well, nearly everyone is excited. You know, there's always a few spoil sports. Luke records in Luke 19, 37 to 40, and by the way, This story is in all four of the Gospels. It's so important, it's in all four of the Gospels. Then as he was now drawing near the descent of the Mount of Olives, the whole multitude of the disciples began to rejoice and praise God with a loud voice for all the mighty works that they had been saying. Blessed is the king who comes in the name of the Lord. Peace in heaven and glory in the highest. And then there's the Pharisees. And they called to him from the crowd. Teacher, rebuke your disciples. And Jesus replies, I tell you, that if these should keep silent, the stones would immediately cry out. It's a high, exciting moment. The city of Jerusalem Jerusalem is, is lighted with radiant light from the sun, and the city gleams white and gold. It's a sight of awe and inspiration. But wait. Look at Jesus. He sways back and forth and his body heaves with sorrow and tears. And the crowd silences. Everyone's attention is riveted. Others begin to sob with him in sympathy. Not understanding the grief, but aware of Jesus' profound grief. Jesus had wept at Lazarus' tomb, but this is different. His words are audible between sobs. Oh, Jerusalem, oh Jerusalem, if you had known, even you, especially in this, your day, the things that made for your peace. But now they are hidden from your eyes, for days will come upon you when your enemies will build an embankment around you and surround you and close you in on every side and they will level you and your children, your children within you to the ground and they will not leave in you one stone upon another because you did not know the time of your visitation. 
The disciples are shocked. The crowd is shocked. What? Not one stone upon another? How could that possibly be? She doesn't know the time of her visitation? What does that mean? The chill in the air and in the soul causes them to pause (coughs) and stare with a sense of foreboding. Jesus slips away unseen to the temple in silent reflection. And the disciples are roused from their reverie to finish the journey. But Jesus is gone. They are left to wonder, what does this mean? We were so sure this morning what happened. How could things have gotten so messed up? So what is important about this story? What do we learn? What can I take home for my own personal reflection? I'd like to make three main points. Number one, deep love always risks rejection, and that involves possibly very deep pain. As I see Jesus weeping in my imagination, I see the anguish he has for his people. These are his people. They have been selected to be an example to the world of what God's people look like. He's covenanted with them to be his special people. He's chosen them to show what it looks like to have a living relationship with God. Yes, there's some who get it and keep choosing him as Lord of their lives. But there's rejection too. Some will see the destruction of Jerusalem and will be killed. His heart breaks at the thought of losing any of them. When we were in Jerusalem, we went to the Burnt House Museum. It was the home of Caiaphas. And we saw the archaeological findings from AD 70. There were bones of a young girl found on the wall and they left the bones where they found them. The pottery that was left filled with food, fragments, the coins that were scattered. We went to um, a, a theater of sorts where the scene was enacted t- retelling the story. It was sobering. But it was a reminder to me that that when we love deeply, we also feel the pain of rejection more deeply. I have an insight into this God who loves so much and is so pained when I choose to ignore or minimalize his love for me by choosing my own way. He's a God who understands every parent's heartbreak over the rejection of their children's heart, either to God or to them. If you love well, you risk hurting deeply. Still love. Number two, Jesus resolutely fulfilled scripture, leading him ultimately to the crucifixion. I think of the disappointment of 1844. The message was so sweet to think that Jesus was coming. And Jesus didn't correct 
their misunderstanding. He wasn't surprised by their disappointments. And God still leads in our lives. So we shouldn't be surprised or shocked when rejection comes or discount that things aren't smooth sailing or there's disruptions. It doesn't mean that God doesn't have a plan for us to experience that joy. Trust him with his timing. Point three. Jesus could see beyond the cross to resurrection and to the glorious coming. I am reminded that beyond the grave there is resurrection. When we lose a loved one, there is resurrection. When we lose a dream, there is a resurrection. God still has a plan. When we are disappointed, God still has plans for something ultimately better for our lives. Jesus could walk that path because he understood that everyone was to have their eyes focused on the events leading up to that weekend. That it was to capture their attention to the complete fulfillment of the ministry of the Messiah. He was not a king riding a horse (coughs) representing military victory over Rome, but he was a righteous king, a humble, gentle, lowly king. He was their righteousness, and he would demonstrate his love on the cross. Jesus ultimately looked to his final rejection by many before his second coming. And the question is, will we have faith? When disappointed, broken, grieving, will we remember that Jesus is coming triumphantly when sorrow and pain and suffering occur in our lives? There's a selection from the Desire of Ages that moves me every time I read it. And I'd like to share these words with you. As the procession is about to descend the Mount of Olives, it is intercepted by the rulers. They inquire the cause of this tumultuous rejoicing. As they question, who is this? The disciples filled filled with the spirit of inspiration answer this question. In eloquent strains, they repeat the prophecies concerning Christ. Adam will tell you. It is the seed of the woman that shall bruise the serpent's head. Ask Abraham. He will tell you. It is Melchizedek, (coughs) king of Salem, king of peace. Jacob will tell you. He is Shiloh of the tribe of Judah. Isaiah will tell you he's Emmanuel, wonderful counselor, the mighty God, the everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. Jeremiah will tell you he's a branch of David, the Lord, our righteousness. Daniel will tell you he's the Messiah. Hosea will tell you he is the Lord God of hosts. The Lord is his memorial. John the Baptist will tell you he's a lamb of God which takes away the sin of the world. The great Jehovah has proclaimed from his throne, this is my beloved son. We, his disciples, declare, this is Jesus, the Messiah, the Prince of Life, the Redeemer of the world. And even the princes of darkness acknowledge him, saying, I know you, who you are, the Holy One of God.
So my friend, who do you say Jesus is? Jesus still loves burritos. And he loves you and I, even when we act like little donkeys. May we keep seeking and honoring and glorifying him and keep the faith in, in Jesus' name. Amen.